as opposed to a magnifying glass with a handle is ideal for traveling with this method is very simple put in the nest on the ground or with your kindling then aim the beam of the sun at the tin nest until it begins to smoke when it starts smoking, gently blow on the tender nest until you produce a flame. Using a magnifying glass to start a fire is easy, but it depends upon having a decent amount of sunlight. Since you can't always depend on the sun being out, it's good to have more methods on hand then just be magnifying glass number four use an alternative to a glass lens besides using glass lens to capture the rays of the sun and produce a fire you can also use water filled balloon or a mirror to achieve the same effect. When using water inside a balloon, try to make the shape into a sphere. The more spherical the container is, the more effective it will be at focusing the rays of the sun. If you don't have a mirror on hand, you can polish the bottom of a soda or a beer. Then a toothpaste or chocolate. Then turn it into a mirror. By the way, if you use this last method, don't eat the chocolate after you've polished your aluminum can weave it. The chocolate may be contain toxic residue. Use friction. One of the most famous way to start a fire without a match is also one of the most difficult using friction. To use this method, make a V-shaped notch in a board of or log and choose a spindle that will create the friction. Rub the spindle between your hands as fast as you can. Moving your hands up and down the spindle rapidly. When the board or log begins to smoke, use your tenderness to catch the glowing spark you produced. You can also create a board drill instead. The board drill is easier than the primitive method described above. But it requires you to prepare a bull first, which is harder. Sixth met method creating a fire without a match when it's wet outside. What if you're in a worst scenario case type of situation? Your matches and lighter have both gotten wet and won't work. You have a tin kit, along with some flint and steel. But your tin kit has gotten wet too. The downpour has also made the forest around you wet. So there is virtually no dry kindling 
or logs anywhere to be found. Are you stuck at this point? No. If you're resourceful, you can still start a fire. Start by finding some dry tinder. The aforementioned birch and cedar bark works well in this scenario. You'll have to peel a few layers of bark off to get to the dry bark. As for finding dry wood, look for a standing dead tree. Unlike a dead tree that's lying on the forest floor, a standing dead tree will usually be dry inside. Peel away the rotted wet outer section of the tree to get the dry wood on the inside. You can use this dry wood as your kindling. Once you have a decent blaze going, you can use even damp limbs and twigs in your fire because the heat of the fire will be strong enough to catch damp wood at that point. Have you missed any? How do you start a fire without matches? The six points above are the most important ones to use when thinking about building a fire outdoors without a match. Whenever you go camping or hiking, it's a good idea to have at least three different tools to start a fire with, along with a tinder kit. Now, let's look at eight basic survival skills you can learn in your own backyard. Learning survival skills in your backyard is a safe and easy way to prepare yourself before heading out into the wilderness. Here are eight basic skills to learn and master so you are ready to tackle any survival situation. First, building a fire. A fire can keep you warm, ward off predators, and provide heat for cooking. Building a fire can be hard when it looks, especially if the weather is the weather is damp or overcast, or in a survival situation when you have few or no enemies. There are several in innovative ways you can create fire without any gear, but they require practice and patience. Testing a few building skills in your backyard is an excellent way to prepare for an emergency. Practice finding or creating dry tinder by carving a feather stick or hunting for a madu. A fungus that grows in the bark of coniferous trees. You can also dig around your backyard for quads to make a flint that can generate a spark. Creating potable water number two. Sourcing clean drinking water is perhaps the single most important skill needed in a survival situation. Unfortunately, natural water sources are not always hygienic and can harbor parasites, viruses, and bacteria. You can create potable water in the world with a few simple techniques that you can easily practice at home. The easier way to purify water in the world is to boil it. 
So you may be left with sediment or other particular particulate matter that affects the taste. Filter the water through a tissue. To build a filtration system using charcoal from your fire and sand and some river rocks inside and upside down the bottom. If you cannot find a source of water, you can practice drawing water from the earth by building a solar steel. A solar steel consists of a hole approximately two feet across by one foot deep. Place a container at the bottom and cover the hole with a tarp or plastic sheet. Sealing the edges with dirt or sand. Place a small rock in the center of the cover and moisture will condense on the underside of the cover and drip into the container. 3. Foraging for food It's surprising how many edible wild plants are available in your backyard farm or around your neighborhood. In a survival situation, plants are vital source of nutrients that you can provide a low impact source of energy. Identifying edible plants can be tricky as many toxic species have similar characteristics as non-toxic ones. But there are a few easily identifiable plants growing rampantly across the country that are not only nutrient dense but also delicious including stinging nettle dandelion lamb squatters and miners lettuce if you are inexperienced at foraging for food it is better to avoid fungi and mushrooms as many species are deadly. You can also brush up on your identification techniques in your backyard by consulting a local botanical guidebook. 4. Tying Knots An often overlooked skill, not tying, can help your chances of survival by helping you build a shelter, set snares, and create tools. Learning how to tie secure knots takes time and practice, so grab a rope and brush up on your knot tying skills making a weapon. If you find yourself in the wilderness without a weapon, you have little defense against predators looking for an easy meal. A single shot is an underrated tool that is quick and easy to make from basic material you can find at home. All you need is a fork stick, a rubber tabbing, and leather or caverns for the pad. Once you have constructed your slingshot, set up a few targets around you, your yard and practice aiming and shooting. Wear eye protection and ensure that no one enters your line of sight as you release your aim. 6. Building a shelter Searching for shelter is one of the first tasks 
accomplish if you get lost in the wilderness. But a safe place to keep out of elements can be hard to find. Put your childhood fort building skills to good use and practice constructing a makeshift shelter in your backyard. Depending on your terrain, environment, and season, there are several options for shelters that you can build. Start with a basic land tool or tap tent and gradually build up your skills until you're comfortable lashing together long branches to form a TP. If you live in an area with heavy winter snows, you can take advantage of the cold weather to practice dipping a snow cave shelter. 8. Basic First Aid When you're out in the wilderness, it can be difficult for emergency services to reach you if you're sick or injured. Understanding and be, being able to administer first aid may save your life and the life of someone you love. Grab a friend, partner, family member and practice administering first aid for a series of common threats in survival situations. These include the basic CPR producer. Procedure Controlling, bleeding, treating bands, stabilizing limbs, finding salting plants for insect stings and abrasion. Fishing and trapping Setting a snare to catch small game and survival fishing are essential skills that allow you to obtain valuable source of protein with little energy expenditure. Snares and fishing techniques vary depending on your prey. So it is important to practice setting a variety of different snares and deploying a range of fishing techniques so you are prepared for any situation. If you practice setting snares in your backyard, make sure you disassemble them after. You are done to avoid injuring local wildlife or neighborhood pets. Don't wait until you're stuck in the wilderness to practice your survival skills. Learning essential skills such as fire building and constructing a shelter is a great weekend project. You can do it in the safety of your backyard. Feeling flat? Here's how to use jump leads. A jump start is a handy way to start a car with a flat battery. But jump leads can cause damage to both cars and people if they are not used properly. For your safety and our peace of mind, we'd always prefer you to give us a call and lead you to jump starting to our training. To a trained mechanic. If you can to do it yourself, take a look at our advice on how to jump start a car, but make sure you read the instructions in your handbook or in, on any article you find. First, these are the things you will need to jump start a car. A pair of walking jump leads. The vehicle with a flat battery 
which needs to be in the spot where jump leads can easily reach the battery with another vehicle with a fully charged battery notice avoid height Avoid a hybrid or electric car as this could cause damage. Using jump leads safely. Before you try to jumpstart a car, remember that batteries produce flammable gases. Here is how to stay safe. Check the battery and jump leads. Never try to jumpstart a battery that looks damaged or is leaking. Don't use jump leads that are damaged. Stop using jump leads if they get hot. Make sure the environment is safe. Before you start, Remove any dangling clothing, like a scarf or tie, as it could get caught up in the moving engine parts. Don't let any metal object touch the car batteries. This could cause a spark and possibly make the battery explode. That includes rings, necklaces, watch straps, hand tools, clips, stray wires, etc. Never smoke or allow naked flames anywhere near either battery. Take care removing the jump leads. Don't remove the jump leads while the car engines are running. This can cause serious damage to the car's electronics. A step-by-step -step guide to jump starting a car. Find someone with a car who is happy to help. Their car must have a fully charged battery with some voltage as yours, usually 12 volts. Line up both cars. Pack both cars so their batteries are within easy reach for one another, with all the cars actually touching. Keep the handbrakes on and the ignitions off. Connect the red jump lid. Use the red jump lid to connect the working batteries positive plus terminal to the flat battery positive plus terminal. Connect the black jump lead. Take the black jump lead and attach it to negative minus terminal on the working battery. Then attach the other end to an earthing point and pointing metal on the engine block or chassis well away from the flat battery and fuel system. Start the other car. Keep both engines off and wait for three minutes. Then start the working car's engine. Let it run for a minute. Start your car.
turn on the engine in the car with a flat battery. Let both cars run. Leave both cars to idle at the first place for around 10 minutes. Turn off and disconnect. Turn off both cars engines and carefully disconnect the leads in the reverse order to the way they were connected. Remove the black lead from your car first and finish with a red lead from the other car. Make sure the lead don't touch one another or either car as you remove them. Restart your car. Try turning the key in the ignition to see if your car will start up. Call for help. If your car won't start, there is probably a more serious problem requiring professional help. How to remove the jump leads? You remove the jump leads in the reverse order to how you attach them. But if you're not sure, here are the steps. Switch off the engines on both vehicles. Take the black jump lead off the earthing point. Remove the other end of the black jump lead from working battery negative minus terminal. Disconnect the red jump lead from the working battery's positive terminal. Remove the other end of the red jump lead from the positive terminal on the flat battery. How to jump start a car with a battery booster pack? It can be a good idea to keep a car battery booster pack in your car. That way, you can jump start your battery even if you can get another car to help you. Before you start, make sure the car battery doesn't look damaged and isn't leaking. You've taken off any metal jewelry or watches and removed dangling clothing like a tie or scarf. Steps to using a car battery booster. 1. Check the battery booster. Make sure the pack's fully charged. Put the battery booster pack somewhere stable. Don't put it on the engine as it might fall off when the engine starts. 2. Connect the red jump lead. Connect the red positive. Plus, jump lead from the battery pack to the positive plus terminal of the car battery. 3. Connect the black jump lead. Connect the black negative minus jump lead to an earthing point on your car. And painting metal on the engine block or chassis is best. 4. Switch on the pack. Once the battery pack's connected, switch on the pack. 5. Try to start the car.
Try to start your car by turning the key in the ignition. If it doesn't start after a few tries, there is probably a more serious problem that needs professional help. 6. Let the engine run. If the car starts, keep the engine running for about 5 minutes. After 5 minutes, switch off the boost pack and allow the engine to run for a further 5 to 10 minutes. Turn off and disconnect 7. Turn off the engine. Remove the leads in the reverse order to how you place them on first. Disconnect the black lead then the red lead. Restart your car. Try turning the keys in ignition to see if the car starts up again. What to do after you've jump-started your car? If you've managed to jump-start your car, the engine will need to recharge again fully. Charge the engine by driving normally. Not in stop-start tra traffic for at least 30 minutes. You can also use portable car battery charger to top up the charge of your battery. How often should you change a car battery? On average, batteries last between 5 and 7 years. But you should only consider changing a car battery when it's showing signs of deterioration. The battery is more than 5 years old and seems like it's struggling to start the car. Get it checked out. It's better to be safe than sorry. It will be worse if it is roadside emergency on a cold morning when you're already late for work. If you have breakdown cover with you, we'll come out to test your battery to see if it needs to charge or if you need a new one. Now, that looks that look at eight reasons. Eight reasons why every child should learn to code. If we want to set our children up for academic success, every child should learn to code. Coding for kids not only helps improve their mathematics and writing skills, but also gives them valuable skills in life and eventually in the workforce. There are various reasons why coding is important to learn and why coding should be taught in schools from an early age. The early children learn to code, the better their chances at success. What is coding? Put simply, coding is a method of communicating with a computer. It is using a language that a computer understands to give a computer instructions in order to perform specific functions. Coding allows us to create things such as computer software, websites, apps, and video games. There are various types of different code depending on what you want to develop and different programming languages that each have their own set of rules but basically 
coding is giving instructions to a computer in order to produce a desired outcome. Help your kids learn to code. Before we get to talking about why every child should learn to code, you may have come here looking to find out how you can teach your child to code. It is easy to get started teaching children to code. Even if you don't have any coding experience yourself, in fact, we've compiled a list of coding concepts even five-year-old can understand. There are so many ways to get started with teaching kids to code. Here are a few suggestions from our, our channel. Start, start out unplugged. You can get started coding with your kids today. It's easy and all you need are items you likely already have already around your house. To first start learning the basics of coding, you don't even need a computer. One of our most popular unplugged coding activities involving learning to code with a deck of cards. You can find out how to learn to code with a deck of cards. Or you can find a whole list of unplugged coding activities. There is an app for that. If you're like me, you struggle with appropriate screen time for your kids. I know that I got to the point where one more YouTube video kids opening and reviewing toys was going to send me over the edge. We try to make our screen time as educational as possible. There are lots of amazing coding apps that can get your kids learning to code without even realizing it. Even popular games like Minecraft have an education edition that helps kids to learn to code. Start with an hour of code. One of the easiest ways to get a test of programming basics for kids is with the fun and free hour of code activities av available online. These activities are designed to take only an hour and can give kids and parents a chance to understand the importance of learning to code. Coding Worksheets our coding worksheets will help to reinforce the basic coding concept learned in the activities above. These worksheets are perfect for the classroom or home. The worksheets should con contain the concept of algorithm, sequencing, loops, variables, composition, branching, and debugging. But why is it important to learn how to code? Why should kids learn coding? There are so many reasons to learn coding. It was hard to pick just eight benefits to learning to code. From problem solving skills, job opportunities, critical thinking and creativity.
There's so many reasons to learn programming. Let's review why kids should learn to code. Here are eight reasons why coding is important to learn for kids. Programming helps children learn to solve problems. Understanding computers and learning the basics of coding helps children to develop an appreciation of how things work. It also teaches them how software engineers use math in order to solve problems in a logical and a creative way. This is an important reason that coding should be taught in schools so children learn these skills while they are young. The ability to solve problems is a trait that is useful in life in general. We all want our children to become excellent problem solvers so that they can overcome an adversity they face. Learning to code gives children the chance to learn this type of skill while they are young and it can help them along the way in life. This is one of the big reasons coding is important to learn. Computer programming gives a kid a challenge and helps them develop resilience. When children learn to code, they develop the ability to bounce back after failure. They learn that failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it can often be something positive because it serves as a learning opportunity. This is one of the most important reasons why kids should code, is as they will learn quickly that debugging your code is half the fun. When you fail and try again, you can learn from your mistakes. Coding gives children the ability to try and try again until they succeed and produce the result they are looking for. Coding teaches children how to think. A computer is a bicycle for your mind, stated Steve Jobs. Learning to code teaches children how to think. Computer programming is, isn't just about teaching how to type lines of code. It is more about teaching children how to think differently. Being able to code effectively. A programmer needs to use logical thinking. They need to be able to see a large problem and break it down into smaller pieces in order to solve it in an effective manner. This is called decomposition and is one of the key features of computational thinking. Children learning code will need to take a vague idea and use their creativity to turn it something effective. If the first solution doesn't work, they try another one. If that one doesn't work, they try again until the problem is solved. Coding helps to develop this way of thinking and these types of thinking skills are highly sought after. A child expands their creativity when they learn how to code. Coding is important to learn because computer programming teaches children to experiment and gives them the confidence to be creative. They will have the chance to design something that is entirely their own. Children thrive off of the feedback they get from cre creating 
something they love. Just like learning a language or to play a musical instrument. Children need motivation. Usually seeing results along the way is enough to cultivate this. And this is what happens when kids kids learn to code. Because coding is easy to pick up for children especially. Confidence comes easily. When children learn how to code, it gives them the opportunity to be confident and create something in a fun and exciting way. Why is learning to code so important? For us, creativity tops the list. We love the creative games and activities our kids can create with coding. Coding doesn't have to be boring. In fact, coding can be fun. Computer programming is the future. When you look at how the world is developing, coding is an extremely useful skill to possess. There are an increasing number of businesses who rely on computer code, not just those in the technology sector. A child who learns how to code will have the advantage in life with more employment opportunities available to them in the future. No matter which industry they decide to enter, whether it be in technology sector, finance, retail, health or others, this is an important reason why coding should be taught in schools. There is a lack of skills in software industry. Experienced computer programmers are in demand, and with the advancement of technology, there are increasing career opportunities arising every day. Employees who can code are the future and are highly sought after in any industry. Because qualified computer programmers are hard to come by, their salaries can be at high level. If children learn to code at a young age, their experience starts young and they are more likely to grow up with an interest in the software industry, therefore contribute to our future. Coding helps children learn how to have fun with math. Coding is the language of maths. Imagine coding being taught in every school. Learning to program involves many skills, including organizing and analyzing data. Children can grow their math skills with coding without even realizing it. Using their logic and calculation skills while creating something of their own can make maths more engaging and fun. Another big reason coding should be taught in schools. Coding is learning while having fun. If you want to give your child something enjoyable to do, which will also be educational and help them to learn. Learning to code is the perfect gift. You can read about the reasons why coding is important. But one of the aim ones is to be is to give them a challenge while having fun. Children will learn various skills and with practice. 
gain some more important skills that can help them through all ways of life. If they can do all of this while having fun, why not? When should my kid learn coding? In our opinion, teaching kids code is something that can be done as early as preschool. In fact, we have an entire post dedicated to ideas for getting preschoolers started with coding. As early as age five, kids can learn the basic concept of coding. Even kids who can't read can learn to code with block-based coding. Why is coding important to learn? We have gone through some great reasons why coding is important to learn for not only children but anyone. If you have a child, giving them the opportunity to learn about technology and the way computers work surely give them an advantage in life. Learning to code while they're young will set them up for a successful future. Let's now take a look at CPR steps as visual guide. Using the CPR steps on someone who is not breathing can help keep them alive until the emergency services arrive. CPR works by keeping the person's blood flowing until healthcare professionals can help them. People without first aid training can still save a life by using the CPR steps. When a person initiates CPR immediately after someone's heart stops beating, CPR can double or even triple the chances of them surviving. CPR steps quick reference. Use CPR when an adult is not breathing or when they are only gasping occasionally and when they are not responding to questions or taps on the shoulders. In children and infants, use CPR when they are not breathing normally and not responding. Check that the area is safe, then perform the following basic CPR steps. Call for emergency, ask someone to help. Lay the person on their back and open the airway. Check the breathing. If they are not breathing, start CPR. Prefer 30 chest compressions. Perform two rescue breathes. Repeat until an ambulance or an automated external defibrillator arrives. CPR step by step. There are two main stages to CPR. The preparation stage and the CPR stage. Preparation steps. Before performing CPR on an adult, using the following preparation steps. Call for emergency help. First, check the scene for factors that could put you in danger, such as traffic, fire, falling machinery. Next, check the person. Do they need help? Tap their shoulder and shout, are you okay? If they're not responding, call for help. 
and bystanders before performing a CPR. If possible, ask a bystander to go and search for an a AED machine. People can find this in offices and many other public buildings. Step 2. Place the person on their back and often and open their airway. Place the person carefully on their back and kneel beside their chest. Tilt their head slightly by lifting their chin. Open their mouth and check for any obstruction such as food or vomit. Remove any obstructions if it is loose. If it's not loose, try to grasp it. May push it further into the airway. Check the breathing. Place your ear next to the person's mouth. And listen for no more than 10 seconds. If you do not hear breathing, or not only hear occasion gasps, begin CPR. If someone is unconscious but still breathing, do not perform CPR. Instead, if they do not seem to have a spinal injury, place them in the recovery position. Keep monitoring their breathing and perform CPR if they stop breathing. CPR steps. Use the following steps to perform CPR. Step 4. Perform 30 chest compressions. Place one of your hands on top of the other and clasp them together. With the heel of the hands and straight elbows. Push hard and fast in the center of the chest slightly below the nipples. Put a push at least two inches deep. Compress their chest at a rate that at least a hundred times per minute. Let the chest rise fully between the compression. Step 5. Perform two rescue breaths, making sure their mouth is clear. Tilt their head back slightly, lift their chin. Pinch their nose shut. Place your mouth fully over theirs. and blow to make their chest rise. If their chest does not rise with the first breath, retilt their head. If their chest still does not rise with the second breath, the person may be shocking. Step 6. Repeat. Repeat the cycle of 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths until the person starts breathing or help arrives. If an AED arrives, carry on performing CPR until the machine is set up and ready to use. CPR for children and infants.
CPR steps for children and infants are slightly different to the step of adults as below. Preparation step. To perform CPR on an infant or adult, use the following preparation steps. Step 1. Call for police. First, check the surrounding area for factors that could put you in danger. Next, check the child or infant to see whether you need help. For children, tap their shoulder and shout, Are you okay? For infant, flick the sole of their feet to see if they respond. If you are alone with the child and they are not responding, give them two minutes of care and then call for help. If there is a bystander, ask them to call for police while you give two minutes of care. If possible, ask a bystander to go and search for AED machine, offices and other public buildings tend to house these. If the child doesn't respond, call for help to report any life-threatening condition. Step 2. Place them on their back and open their airways. Place the child or infant carefully on their back and kneel beside their chest. Tilt their head backward slightly. By lifting their chin. Open their mouth. Check for any obstruction such as food or vomit. If it's loose, remove it. If it is not loose, do not touch it. As this may push it further into their airways. Step 3. Check for breathing. Place your ear next to their mouth and listen for around 10 seconds. If you do not hear breathing or you only hear occasional gasps, begin to administer CPR. Changes in an infant breathing patterns or normal. As they usually have periodic breathing, Keep monitoring their breathing and perform CPR if they stop breathing. CPR steps. Use the following steps to perform CPR on a child or an infant. Step 4. Perform two rescue breathes. If the child is not breathing, perform two rescue breathes with their head titled backward and their chin raised. For a child, pinch their nose shut and place your mouth over theirs. Breathe into their mouth twice. For an infant, place your mouth over their nose and mouth and blow for one second to make their chest, their chest rise. Then deliver two rescue breaths. If they are still unresponsive, begin chest compression. Step 5. Perform 30 chest compression. Kneel beside the child or infant. For a child, use one of your hands. Place the heel of the hand their stern, sternum which is in the center of the chest between and slightly below their nipples press down hard and fast around two inches deep for one third the depth of the chest at at least a hundred times per minute for an infant use two fingers Place your fingers in the center of their chest, between and slightly below the nipples. Perform 
30 feet compressions around one and a half inches deep. Step six, repeat. Repeat the cycle of rescue breaths and chest compressions until the child starts breathing or help arrives. When to use CPR and when not to. Use CPR when an adult is not breathing at all. For a child or an infant, use CPR when they are not breathing normally. Always use CPR if the adult or child is not responding when you talk to them or tape them. If someone is not breathing, giving CPR can ensure the oxygen-rich blood reaches the brain. This is important as without oxygen, someone can sustain permanent brain damage or die in under 8 minutes. person might need CPR if they stop breathing in any of the following circumstances. A cardiac arrest or heart attack, shocking, road traffic accident, near drowning, suffocation, poisoning, drug or alcohol overdose. Smoke inhalation, electrocution, suspected sudden infant death syndrome. Only perform CPR if the adult is not breathing, or in child, or in children and infants, when they are not breathing normally, and their blood is not circulating. This is why it is important to ensure that the person does not respond to verbal or physical calls to attention before starting the CPR processes. CPR is a life-saving first aid procedure. It can significantly improve someone's change of surviving it if they suffer a heart attack or stop breathing following an accident or trauma. The steps vary depending on whether the person is an infant, child or adult, whether the basic cycle of chest compression and rescue breathes will remain the same. Only use CPR when an adult has stopped breathing. Check the person to see whether they respond to verbal or physical stimuli before starting CPR. My name is Kibera Freddy.